I think they wanted us to read a fragment from the book oh, first. Oh, I see. All right. Do you want me to go first? Yeah. All right. Everyone can hear? Yeah? See, see. All right. Very nice. Uh, let's go here. So, this is from the preface, so the beginning of the book. The twilight of dying ideas. Deindustrialize your musical imagination. Shut down the failing factories of tired once futures. Metal machine music is no more. Tear yourself from the shriveled teat of the 20th century. Everything about the old future you once loved is rotting and in rigor mortis. Dance music's done. It's dead and desecrated with no hope of resurrection. Synthesizers and samplers have been sucked dry and now they're completely depleted. They have nothing left to give you. You're not going to get anything new or anything sonically impossible from either of them. Nothing has done, uh, nobody has done for decades. Music doesn't sound like spaceships and cybermen anymore, nor does it sound like shrapnel or cold steel. It's not about the rocket fuel propulsion or mechanized movement. Robot rhythms are boring now. Techie timbres are trite. So fuck your dad futures, fuck all your museum futures and your putrefying futures and your calcifying futures that have formed like a plaque in the imaginations of music enthusiasts everywhere. This book isn't about a pacified pantheon of pre-approved pioneers. It's not about James Brown or Lee Scratch Perry or Public Enemy or Tim Bland or Wiley, nor for that matter is it about Acid House or Techno or Jungle or Garage or Footwork. It's time for new titans to shine and new sounds to astound. Declare gory and glorious jihad on all the jaded journalists writing stillborn obituaries to their distant youths an insurgency lurks in the shadows. Nostalgia's of venom bleed it out of you. The past is parasitical. Cripple it, paralyze it, do whatever you have to do to exercise its wicked sickness from you. It's nothing... <laughs> shouldn't have read this, is nothing but a chafing, flaking phallus that's hopelessly being, <laughs> hopelessly <laughs> being throttled long after, I'm not reading that in public, I'll move on to the next bit, we've been indoctrinated and corrupted by the orthodoxy of the robo-future for far too long, our synesthesias suffocating in moribund musical metaphors and kitsch visions of the centuries and millennia ahead, free your mind from this conceptual stasis. For decades, we've witnessed the industrialization of sonic sensation, from funk's rhythmic division of labor to the automation, the electrification, the mechanization of the synthesizer era, to raves economies of scales in which escalating tempos track rising rhythmic productivity. House, 130 BPM. Hardcore, 150 BPM. Jungle, 160 BPM. Gabba, with its growling, goose-stepping pistons pounding at maximum capacity, 200 BPM. But listen closely enough now and you can hear the generators of the old future winding down. 90 BPM, 80 BPM, 70 BPM, 60 BPM. Rhythm is reaching absolute zero. The depowered lethargy zone of anti-groove and counter-momentum. The resting heart rate is now the tempo of tomorrow. The future has become human. False prophets fearfully warned you that the 21st century hailed the end of innovation and the death of progress. They told you it was the slow cancellation of the future, but really it was, the, it was slowness cancelling a future in an eruption of creative destruction that gave birth to everything that's come since. We're done with the old codified modes of sonic imagination. New metaphors have been born and our synesthesia is being transformed. So come smash your old paradigms, set them ablaze and be amazed at the sounds of the next century. It's time to define the new musical sublime. There's a whole new future waiting to derange you. Strap in. Bueno, lo voy a leer en español porque han sido las órdenes y puede estar bien escuchar la traducción. Eh, despréndete del pezón marchito del siglo XX. Todo lo que alguna vez amaste del viejo futuro se haya en estado de putrefacción o de rigor mortis. La música dance está acabada, muerta y profanada, sin esperanza de resurrección. Los sintetizadores y samplers están exhaustos y completamente secos. No tienen nada más para dar. Ya ninguno de los dos dará nada nuevo o sónicamente imposible. No lo han hecho en décadas. 
la música ya no suena a naves espaciales y cyborgs, tampoco a metralletas y acero. Ya no se trata de propulsiones de cohete y movimientos mecánicos. Los ritmos robóticos ahora son aburridos. Los timbres tequi están manidos. Así que a la mierda el futuro de tus padres. A la mierda los futuros de museo y los futuros putrefactos y calcificados que se formaron como sarro en la imaginación de los fans de la música de todas partes. Este libro no es sobre un panteón pacífico de pioneros autorizados. No es sobre James Brown, Lee Scratch Perry, Public Enemy, Timbaland o Wiley. Para el caso, tampoco es sobre el acid house, techno, jungle, garage o footwork. Es hora de que brillen nuevos titanes y sorprendan nuevos sonidos. Declara la yihad sangrienta y gloriosa a todos los periodistas hastiados de escribir obituarios muertos al nacer para sus lejanas juventudes. Una insurgencia acecha en las sombras. La nostalgia es un veneno. Elimínalo del cuerpo. El pasado es parasitario. Inutilízalo, paralízalo, haz lo necesario para exorcizarte de su malvada enfermedad. No es nada más que un falo derrotado y flácido que sigues estrangulando sin esperanza mucho después de haberlo hecho eyacular por última vez. Por el amor de Dios, deja ir al pobre. La ortodoxia del futuro robótico nos viene adoctrinando y corrompiendo desde hace demasiado tiempo. Nuestra sinestesia se está sofocando en metáforas musicales muertas y visiones kits de los siglos y milenios por venir. Liberemos la mente de ese estancamiento conceptual. Hemos presenciado la industrialización de la sensación sónica durante décadas. Desde la invención del trabajo rítmica del funk y la automatización, la electrificación, la mecanización de la era del sintetizador a las economías de escala de las raves, donde el tempo intensificado perseguía una productividad ritmecánica cada vez mayor. House 130 BPM, Hardcore 150 BPM, Jungle 160 BPM, Gaber, con los pistones rugiendo a máxima capacidad, 200 BPM. Pero si escuchas con atención, ahora se oyen los generadores del viejo futuro quedarse sin potencia. 90 BPM, 80 BPM, 70 BPM, 60 BPM. El ritmo está por alcanzar el cero absoluto, la zona de letargo de potenciado del anti-groove y el contraimpulso. El reposo cardíaco en reposo ahora es el tempo del mañana. El futuro se ha vuelto humano. Falsos profetas advirtieron con temor que el siglo XXI traería el fin de la innovación y la muerte del progreso. Hablaron de la lenta cancelación del futuro, pero en realidad era la lentitud la que estaba cancelando un futuro, en un estallido de destrucción creativa que dio origen a todo lo que viene surgiendo desde entonces. Estamos hartos de los viejos modos encriptados de la imaginación sónica. Han nacido nuevas metáforas y nuestra sinestesia se está transformando. Así que destroza tus viejos paradigmas. Hazlos arder y deslúmbrate con los sonidos del próximo siglo. Es hora de definir el nuevo sublime musical. Un nuevo futuro espera para enloquecerse. Ajustaros los cinturones. Um, well, since we have started uh, reading this part of the preface, I, I think you could start uh, telling us why did you choose to frame your book in terms of the future and the futuristic images? Well, I suppose uh, what I find very interesting about music is uh, the notion of innovation. So that music, every five years, every three years, is going to sound very different. So, you know, I think even more than film or more than even fashion, maybe, you do have a thing of you're going to have a distinct sound in the 60s or even different parts of the 60s, then in the 70s, so forth, so on. Uh, and so I suppose this, the notion of futurism is you're distilling that innovative aspect uh, and really pushing it forward. So I suppose that's one element of it. I suppose the other thing is there's a kind of, almost a kind of a, a gnosis implied by the idea of a future. There's something a kind of, something beyond the everyday, beyond us, so kind of an extremity of, of affect of how we feel or how we respond to it. So I suppose, uh, yeah, that would really be why. And I suppose the other thing is also that the music itself elicits, you know, kind of uh, makes me think of, you know, kind of conjures notions of the future, I think, to me as a listener as well. So I suppose those would be the reasons why. 
but who are you talking to? Because it seems to me that like there's like a people that you are like imagining or talking against that are like the prophets of the no future. Ah, so who who is that people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the foreword of the book was done by a man called Simon Reynolds, sort of a famous author, and he wrote a book called Retromania. His argument was that we had had this big long period, I guess in the post-war years, uh, where music was always innovative, lots of new things, and he would argue in the 21st century that slowed down, that suddenly we don't have this innovation anymore. He was one person. Then there was also a guy called Mark Fisher, who sadly died, and he actually, my English publisher, Repeater, I think he was one of the co-founders of that, he had a similar idea. He called it the slow cancellation of the future. So that's a not so indirect kind of a response to their arguments. It's actually, and I th it's actually to say, no, 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 we're not, I'm not uh, accepting this orthodoxy that things have got boring now just because a certain generation of music critics have become middle-aged. So, uh, so yeah, this is kind of, I mean, if I'd remembered everything I'd written in that, I might not have chose that bit to read now, but it's my kind of, a bit kind of uh, aggressive, trying to reset the narrative and the paradigm. From what I can tell, this future would, would be a result of uh, the in technological innovation in vocality, uh, particularly in, in like auto-tune. Um, I think that's like the main device that you talk about. So um, how does it come that like this technological shift has the quality or, or like the possibility of creating like a synesthesia that... Yeah, 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 yeah. That's very interesting, actually. Well, I mean, I suppose, I suppose the thing, what you're having there is you're genuinely creating unprecedented sounds. So people are creating noises that we've never heard before uh, because we literally didn't have the technology to produce these noises. So there were kind of digital voices we're hearing now that we wouldn't have heard three years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. It would have just been impossible to have done so. And so I suppose that does conjure a synesthesia insofar as your mind then has to kind of wrap itself around what it's hearing. I suppose the human brain is very relational to things. So I think a lot of people will hear sounds as colors or they'll hear textures. People might talk about sort of a wobbly sound or a metallic sound. And so I suppose in, when we introduce new sounds, our synesthesia then has to sort of come up with these new ways of comprehending it, I guess. Part of how I feel this vocality um, is innovative uh, has to do with like what, what you say like uh, it doesn't have like a communicative intent as like older rap would in comparison um, so I don't know for me like the way I receive your text um, I felt that like that might be like a consequence of like the informative overload that we live in, like the 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 will to use our voices in ways that are like not as communicative because we live in in like constant communication. So, do you think like this is something that's like behind this innovation? Well, that's a very interesting. I'm not sure I've, I've sort of thought of it like that, but I think it probably is true. I mean, if you think of say internet culture, which is the kind of hub of where we're, uh, this, o this kind of overstimulation you're talking about. Uh, I suppose there's a real thirst for novelty on the internet. So people on TikTok or YouTube, whatever, they're watching any old shit, and it's ridiculous, but it's just this thirst for novelty. And so I suppose the kind of pushing the voice to the extremes that artists do, the digital kind of voice, I suppose, you're, yeah, you're right. It's, it's, you're trying to grab an audience's attention and an, aud an audience that's so overstimulated, so thirsting for novelty. And so I suppose it's a kind of just an inevitable consequence of that kind of information overload. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you maybe like talk a little bit about how this sort of vocal psychedelia, as you, as you talk about it, um, is opposed to the spoken word as it used to be like the reality of urban music? Yeah, well, that's very interesting. I mean, so the, 
the way the voice is being used now, it's like the modern day equivalent of a synthesizer or an electric guitar or something like that. So the, the, the variation of noises, just pure noise you're getting from these things, it kind of means that, yeah, the kind of an artist's maybe primary intent. I mean, to say that a lot of modern artists, the way they become f famous or gain notoriety is actually by coming up with a new noise with, the, with this kind of technology. And so I suppose, yeah, it's the kind of, uh, it's, yeah, so I, sp I suppose it, the kind of the, the, the timbre, the texture of the voice supersedes any kind of words or lyrics and a lot of the time actually obscures them. So it becomes, the voice is so distorted, so subverted, so corrupted, actually becomes very hard to even understand or comprehend what the artist is saying. I think auto-tune also enables a vocal artist to uh, somehow use uh, like things that are not like linguistic as such, but are vocal like, um, I don't know, like sobbing or like whining or, or just like screeching or this kind of thing. Yeah. And I, in my mind, like this is, this is possible in a non-ridiculous way because it like auto-tune makes it melodic. So like you get like the emotional intensity of mm. like that, I guess like it's like a human thing that like mm. we feel empathetic towards like certain sounds, certain vocal sounds. But the, the fact that that's put into a song, um, I think it works because it's turned into something melodic. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. So, so say with, with auto-tune or similar kind of technologies, say if you have a kind of a scratch in your throat, a bit of a growl in your voice, the technology is going to absorb that and technologize it. It's going to kind of make it feel radiant. So it's going to give it this kind of strange musical quality, this kind of futuristic, slightly sci-fi quality. Um, and so you're right. It does mean that you can incorporate increasing amounts of vocal stuff, a lot of which is non-linguistic at all, into something that then becomes musical and then kind of what you could call sonic science fiction in a way. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a one artist in the book, a guy called Tommy Lee Sparta. So he has this kind of, his voice is so nasal with this technology, sort of sounds like a snake charmer's flute. Uh, and he said that was about when he was a child, his mum would tell him he wasn't allowed to open his mouth when he talked. So I mean, bit, must be a bit of a controlling mum, but, but it is that kind of thing of just these very weird individual quirks that people have, you're suddenly technologizing that, you're musicizing it, and uh, yeah, and so I think, it, you're, as you say, you're kind of opening up all this oratory potential to kind of become music now. Yeah. What do you think is the relationship of this uh, to um, like microphones and like the improvement of microphones as such, because I, 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 I felt uh, like there's like a connection of what, like you, you mentioned as like slime, and this is related like in internet culture uh, to ASMR, right? And I don't know, like I, I feel that like what ASMR has done is like it has allowed to, it has allowed us to listen to sounds that actually uh, are part of like intimacy, like like some sort of sounds that you can only hear if you are like super yeah. close to something. And um, so I think that like maybe like part of like the landscapes that you talk about like are related to this, to the fact that like there are sounds that used to belong to intimacy and now can be part of music. That's very interesting. And I'm annoyed I didn't put that in the book. That's very good. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, that, I, haven't, I didn't even think of that. That's very interesting. So, yeah, one, one thing about with this auto-tune is you're getting, as you say, kind of... So, so you're really kind of exploring the inside of the mouth, the vocal cords, and then you're heightening it up, you're electrifying it, kind of robotizing it, turning it to kind of robot noise. Uh, and, yeah, so as you say, I suppose you do you have this cultural phenomenon on the internet, people talking into the microphone and doing all that. And so it is, yeah, I suppose there is that kind of thing, which I didn't think of. But so when we reprint the book, 
I'm nicking your idea. I can put that in. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. In, in terms of like, I mean, given that that this technology allows for a different kind of like, it's not. So it's not singing, and it's also not the spoken word. So it's something else, and maybe that's what why you use the term vocal psychedelia. Um, but um, would you say that like the composition technique of people who write uh, this music, frag rap or mambo rap or however you want to call it, would you say like in w in what ways would you say it's different to a book of rhymes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's the thing. So I think traditionally music, obviously the vocal has been melodic. And then, of course, in the kind of age of rap music, the past 40 years or so, you've then had this idea of the rhythmic spoken word. That's, that's also then a kind of music. And so now we've got a new, whole new paradigm in which it's really about the texture of the voice, the timbre of the voice. Uh, and and the kind of the exploration of that as a musical force. And I think that was something that wasn't particularly possible before we had this technology, or, you, or the options were very limited. You could, there are certain things you could do with a human voice, and I think this has just blown the door wide open. It's, uh, you can create so many sounds with that. And so, yeah, so then it, so as I said, it becomes like, um, yeah, in the way someone would have a synthesizer, and maybe the most interesting thing about synthesizers is not the melody you play, but rather the weird sounds, you could, the alien sounds you can get with it. I think in the kind of last, I mean, particularly last five years, but really in the last 10 years or so, that same principle has been now applied to these digital voices. So maybe you want to explain or talk a little bit about why you chose to put together these genres that like you mentioned to me yesterday that maybe you wouldn't use those terms now and this has been a huge debate in Spain like some years ago so but you are talking about trap drill and bashment which is something that here we would simply call dancehall um, so why did you put them together and after that if, if you can like mix your answers I, I would like to know uh, the particular place of dancehall in all of this, because as I see it, it's like the only one of, of these uh, genres um, that allows for intimate connection between bodies and not like your own like no, uh, mental, mystical, uh, yeah, transcend transcendence. Well, uh, as far as the putting them all together, sort of a mistake. I. Uh, I wrote the book, and then I suddenly realized I wanted to change the whole thing. And by then, we had already picked a name and everything. And uh, so I changed, I changed it all, and the publisher was very angry with me. Uh, and so then we've ended up with this slightly strange book. Where it's sort of in the middle of two ways of thinking, two ideas. Um, and so, yeah, so as far as the dancehall thing goes, so this is Jamaican music, uh, dancehall. And so, kind of ironically, in the book, I use terms like trap or dancehall, but then I argue that these, the sounds I'm talking about aren't trap or dancehall. So this was sort of one of the mix-ups, really. Uh, I, so I'd argue there's a new genre, which I've called vocal psychedelia, which is about what we were talking about, the kind of extreme elements of the digital voice. Um, and so as far as dancehall's placement in the book, for me, the, the, the Jamaican stuff is really the heart of the book. That's, you could get rid of everything else and really still be telling pretty much the same story, really. Uh, and so Jamaican music does have this tradition of vocal extremity, vocal novelty, kind of far more embracing of gimmicks and things. Say, American rap, I think everyone would be too cool to do sort of a silly voice, whereas in Jamaica... They're more than happy to. And so I suppose that gave Jamaicans a bit of a head start in producing this kind of music, really. But I would, I would assume that uh, at a popular level, dancehall music is, is more important in terms of dancing than in terms of... Uh, the, and I, I only say this because I think the equivalent for us here is what's called reggaeton. And I th like there's like some dancehall here, like there's like people who claim to 
do dancehall, but I think like the scene as such like is like reggaeton, and I think there are like similarities of like post-colonial uh, spaces and whatever. Um, so yeah, like from like the perspective of just like being here in clubs or anything, and also just like at looking at how people like and involve themselves with reggaeton. I, I would like say that like even like theoretical or like more conceptual discourses about it, like about like the powerful parts of it are based uh, in like the attention to the body, yeah, like yeah. how bodies interact. So not so much vocality, which I think m maybe the, like it's intertwined, but I, I would like to know like your opinion about this. No, that's very interesting. I mean, I, uh, I I probably dug myself into a little bit of a hole in the book where I'd come up with one concept that was all about, oh, it's not about the body anymore, uh, which, prob which reflects a lot of the music in there, but it's probably not my full feelings about all the music. And I, and I think maybe one of the strengths of the Jamaican stuff, not only is it kind of the most innovative stuff, but as you say, it's very much connected to dancing, to clubs, to nights out. And so I suppose if you're kind of... Uh, you want to be intoxicated by the music, you want to feel a kind of a gnosis from the music, be hypnotized and entranced with the music. I suppose a, a, a music that overtakes you physically is going to have that kind of ability to do that. And so I suppose, yeah, one of the key strengths of the Jamaican stuff, as you say, would maybe be it's, it's the more danceable end of this stuff and the other genres less so. And that, that, that maybe then precludes a bit more of a... Uh, a meditative headspace, a uh, more relaxed, tranquil one. But maybe every, one of the reasons the Jamaican stuff's so good is maybe that it does have that real physical urgency to it. In terms of the reception of dancehall in the UK, which is where you come from, um, is, is, is there like would you say there has been like a linguistic change in like people who are involved uh, with popular music because of it? Because here, for example, like everyone that's been like paying attention to to that in in within like the Spanish-speaking context, like we can say that like it hasn't also like the way that I mean like reggaeton, which comes from Latin America, of course. Um, it's like affected and changed so much, not, not only the way people who make music compose their lyrics, but also just like the ways that people that are involved and like part of like popular music scenes just like talk and write. So how would you say like the linguistic um, ecosystem of Jamaica has influenced the popular music culture in the, in the UK? Yeah, so, so uh, after World War II, there were lots of uh, Jamaican and West Indian immigrants came to the UK to sort of help us rebuild our infrastructure. So we have have this kind of, I guess, 50, 60 year history of sort of everyone, at least people living in major uh, cities in the UK, are desperate to try and be seen as cool by the Jamaicans that live next door. So when I, you know, when I go to school, we were all speaking with sort of Jamaican patois because we'd have, you know, all our friends would be Jamaicans uh, and all the friends who weren't Jamaicans wish they were Jamaican. Um, and so, yeah, so Jamaica's this huge cultural uh, kind of sway over British music. I mean, even think something as poppy as The Police, the band The Police, this thing, you know, he's at, they're making reggae. Uh, and so let alone then genres like jungle or drill, which I talk about in the book, which... Uh, yeah, th those, those are likewise uh, heavily influenced by uh, Jamaican music. So I think uh, kind of to understand British music, uh, yeah, the kind of, you have to understand that Jamaica is our absolute, we love, Jama we love Jamaican music more than American music, more than British music. Uh, yeah, it's kind of, Jamaica is this huge cultural sway over us. Our whole notion of cool in the UK really is, comes from jamaican -ness. So yeah, it is this kind of, and is the lexicon that's used in in that music is it understandable for for every like English speaker there? Because when I I've I've read like 
you know, like dance hall Jamaican lyrics, and I, I can't understand the, the English because it's also written differently. They don't have like the same letters for the same sounds, or what looks to me are the same sounds. So. I, I think it would be uh, it. It depends uh, how young you are, how urban you are, uh, really. So, say my grandma probably wouldn't understand any of the lyrics in my book, but. Uh, yeah, and I think, I think if you're someone my age, if someone younger, yeah, we probably do actually have quite a good working knowledge of Jamaican patois, as we call it, kind of a Jamaican Creole. Uh, yeah, just because we're so kind of inundated with Jamaican culture. And of course, we're going to school with Jamaican kids or our teachers will be Jamaican. So it's kind of, yeah, it's a huge sort of woven into our everyday life. Yeah, yeah. So I think for, for us, the lyrics are comprehensible. Yeah. Okay. Um, in your book, um, you you talk a lot about like cyborgs and like the post-human and like things that are related to biotechnology. Um, and I, I'm this is I don't know like it's not a criticism, but I would like to know because for me, like as a feminist, I I know like how like all of this theory comes from basically like scholars or, or activists who are like hardcore feminists. And it, it's like striking at some point the lack, the, the absence of, of non-male people in, in, the, in the book. And I don't know if this is related to how like the scene or like vocal psychedelia such has been constructed in, in the UK and in the US, but here, I mean, I would say that, like, yes, like, probably the people who are considered, like, the pioneers of, of like, this vocal psychedelia are, like, more men in number than other kind of genders. But it's also, like, I would say it's, like, a scene that has, like, sort of, like, important, like, queer presence and female, of course. So, um, I don't know. Uh, can you explain a little bit about this? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's, it's funny because every interview I get asked a question about either gender, queer theory, or uh, kind of racial stuff. And uh, I've written a very silly book. People want to give me to give very s serious answers. Um, I mean, I think, so, so there really aren't very many female artists in the book. And so I suppose there are three options to why there might be. So it could be I'm an unconscious misogynist, and I've sort of shut them all out. And possibly the, the scenes that are producing these artists, maybe they have a slight problem with a, or kind of either kind of a toxic masculinity or kind of excluding women, or there's something maybe more broad in the music industry, or of course a combination of all three. I, I mean, you, you told me you were going to ask me this question, and, I, and people have asked me before. I've never really come up with a good answer to it. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I suppose it'd be maybe for you guys to maybe figure out why you think these things are. I mean, I suppose it's in slight, might be in slight bad taste for me if I were to say, oh, you know, kind of Jamaican music cultures misogynistic or excluding women, because then I'm, then you're introducing a whole new problematic paradigm of this middle-class English white man telling these Jamaicans that they're doing everything wrong. So uh, I think it's probably, I'll give you my very long-winded and ambiguous answer to that question, I think. <laughs> okay, um, but would you say that not in the case of drill, which I, I feel it's like, and as you say, it's like hyper-masculine, but maybe like for trap and dancehall or let's not use those names, but it's difficult anyhow. Um, would you say like that this use of vocality is um, like a, somehow like some sort of tool for like demasculinization? Well, it's very interesting. So one thing that autotune does is it, it narrows the frequency range of the voice. So it makes the voice very nasal sounding. And so you have lots of popular artists lean into that. And so you get these very, very nasal voices or kind of these strange kind of impish elf-like voices and all that. And uh, 
And so I suppose the kind of natural assumption for a lot of people is that it is a kind of feminizing, you know, it's kind of, you're moving away from traditional big, boomy voices to these very thin voices. But then the lyrics will still be all about how they sleep with lots of women, how they shoot all their friends in the face. Uh, you know, so it's kind of, you do have this disconnect between what you're hearing sonically, which, as you say, is kind of shattering traditional gender roles with then this very conser socially conservative, uh, kind of misogynistic machismo in the lyrics. So I think it is a kind of a weird contradiction in the music. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, I suppose it'd be the thing of we can project, as listeners, uh, we can project something onto the music that the artists don't seem to be particularly intending themselves. And how do you think drill music fits into all of this narrative? Because I, I that's like the sort of like group of songs that I know less of, like I'm less familiar with, uh, in partly I think because it's not as big in Spain, although like n right now they are like sort of like using the discourse that it is, has, and like it arrived to sort of like take the place of trap, whatever. But for me, it's like just at this point, at least like I, I feel it's like some sort of like It's like mimic in the UK right now. It's like grime music. It wasn't ever like a big thing here. There are like a couple artists there and there that, yeah, maybe they were doing grime, but it wasn't like a yeah, yeah, yeah. huge thing. Um, so drill music, I don't know. For me, there are like some artists, but I, I don't think there's like the social or not that I've seen, maybe I'm just like lacking some perspective, but I don't think like there's like the social context for a drill to happen here maybe. And like reading your book, I I grasp the idea somehow of how it's, it's like a thing in the UK, like also watch a documentary, which maybe I didn't like a lot of the perspective, but it also offered me like, yeah, I don't know, like a perspective on how it's like very much a thing also in, in the media in the UK. So I don't know. But on the other hand, like in terms of vocality, I don't feel the, I don't know, like the transcendence that you talk about, like in the other two genres. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as I said, I didn't really know what I was writing until after I finished the book. Um, so, so I think drill is a very odd fit because I talk all about vocal psychedelia, all these digital voices. Drill has none of that. So, uh, so it's yeah. So drill is this kind of bit, bit strange inclusion in the book, and that was because I liked it. Um, so yeah, it's a very sort of very different musically. It, it operates the kind of innovative thing about it. The interesting thing is these drums, these very intricate kind of asymmetric uh, fiddly drums. Uh, that'd be, whereas the other stuff, it'd be more the vocals that are interesting. Um, as far as its kind of cultural place in the UK, so at the end of the 2010s, I think there was lots of kind of violent crime in the UK, kind of gang culture, lots of stabbing. And so there was a while where drill really was this kind of quite sinister, dark kind of documentarian music about this gang life. So you kind of all the, all the different drill groups, their names would be the names of real gangs, in, mainly in South London, but elsewhere as well. Uh, you know, artists were actually getting killed, you know, kind of notorious artists were actually ending up dead or in prison. Uh, so yeah, so for a while it's very much connected to this. It was in the media a lot, there's a kind of a moral panic about it, so we're always drill leading to kids stabbing each other and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it was a big phenomenon. I think now, in the last few years, it's probably been a bit co-opted by the mainstream. I think now you get, you know, you can a little bit more pop-friendly drill. I think it's it's been severed from that, uh, its traditional cultural roots, which is nice morally, but maybe it does lose something, it loses a mystique. So I think when I was first listening to it, it really did feel like I was entering in this whole secret society, you know, this kind of whole world where they were talking strange slang with strange codes that no one understood as I think it's probably lost that now. Uh, yeah, so I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, somehow. Um, how would you, I think 
a lot of people here that, like, yeah, like we don't know that much about like drill music. Like, how would you describe the anonymity that you talk about in the book? Anonymity. Oh, so, so drill. So there's a thing they'd all wear balaclavas in their videos and things, and this was because they would. They, they were kind of notorious cases of people being filmed in music videos and that actually being used in court by the police as evidence of their involvement in gangs. So they started wearing these masks and they'd say, no face, no case. As in, so don't show your face and it can't be used in a court case. So there's that. Then they would, the, all their names, their kind of artist names, were things kind of like C1, AM. They were all these kind of sound like codes rather than fun nicknames. And, and the music was very homogenous. It all sounded very similar. It was all same sort of drum, same sort of piano. So it's kind of one track, all sort of sounded like another. So in the book, I talk about this aesthetic of anonymity, that the whole, the whole music conjures this kind of notion of, yeah, this kind of loss of identity, which I think is very different from what we're talking about with, say, the Jamaican artists, where everyone has a very distinct sound, where everyone's almost their own genre. It's kind of one-man genre. With drill, it was everyone sounded the same. It was sort of, but that becomes a kind of a, an aesthetic in and of itself. So why do you think all, all of these um, songs that you talk about um, somehow uh, establish the fact of, of playing with like the self, with like one's identity in, in the center of, of their uh, work. I mean like, um, so here there was like this, um, there is um, this philosopher uh, who wrote a, a book about trap music. And I, I don't know if he was in the book or in an interview, but like he, he's, he's called Ernesto Castro. He, he said that like, trap music was narcissistic, but like on the other hand, like he said that if, if it, like it would be worrying if it wasn't narcissistic because everything's narcissistic nowadays. So it's like maybe seeker not being narcissistic than being narcissistic. So, um, I mean, this is just like an example to, to like, like uh, allow your book to dialogue with something that people might know of, but I'm interested in like why like everything seems to be like, and also I mean like you also talk about trauma, like in like in relation to uh, to trap music, like how trauma is there. Uh, so I I feel like in any case there's like like a very conscious work with like one's own identity, and. I wonder if you have like a theory as of to why it's so. Well, I think you were, the voice traditionally in music would kind of be the self. It'd be you're projecting a persona in a way that a drum can't really express a self, can't really express a person. Um, whereas the voice very much can. The, the voice is the relational thing. So as a listener, you'd hear the voice and you sort of, you can relate to that as a person talking to you. Uh, and so I suppose then you have a very strange thing happens with this music, with the, with the vocal psychedelia we're talking about, with the digital voices, where suddenly the voice then becomes this strange kind of fantastical, inhuman sounding thing. And so I suppose there is a kind of implicit uh, subversion of, uh, of, as you say, the kind of musical identity, of the projection of identity. Um, uh, and I suppose you, you have the thing of the, the way that uh, these technologies, auto-tune and stuff, interact with the voice are very similar to, you know, say if you do a deep fake, so, you know, if you, if you film a face and it, the kind of computer can put another face on it, or if you think of, uh, you know, in films, the guy who plays the Hulk, it's an actor playing the Hulk, and then digitally you've put the Hulk over him, it does his face, his movements, so the same thing's happening with the voice, so then you're, you're opening up this whole kind of realm of a, a very malleable, very kind of um, easily changed and adaptable kind of digital identity. I mean, if you think people kind of, uh, the filters they use on Snapchat or they're kind of changing their avatars, I think digital existence uh, allows you far more, far more malleability and subversion of your identity than just existing in the world. And so I think there is a, a 
again, a kind of an unconscious, or there's a, there's a kind of a, it's echoed, I think, in the, in the way that the voice is also digitized. So going back to music, um, I believe that your background is like, uh, like you're a musician yourself, and also like the, I would say like the cultural system that you are dialoguing with is like musical criticism somehow, right? Um, so my background, I would say like is maybe like more like literary and cultural studies, whatever. And for me, um, I, I really like the idea of like putting vocality in the center of music because, um, yeah, I mean like as someone who like Th thinks of poetry or whatever. I, I, I think it's like a way of um, allowing music to, to like be seen as like a verbal art mm. too. So I was wondering like uh, how, how you feel about this idea of like, um, I mean, as you know, like, like poetry used to be music with words and then like it just like became like more textual, so to say. And I feel that, um, yeah, like putting the focus on language, even if it's not language, just like pre-verbal vocality, somehow like, I don't know, like tells us that there could be like more attention to language in, within like musical criticism. What do you think? Well, that, that all sounds very clever, and maybe a bit, bit too clever for me. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean it, well, I'm not really familiar with anything, anything critical at all. I was sort of just making up the book as I went along, really. But yeah, so I mean, I, 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 suppose, it, I suppose, yeah, there is a kind of, you would have a whole kind of, a, you know, a field of study, of research, of theorizing that would be more focused on the voice that probably... And I suppose you do have potential with this stuff now that you have technology, innovation, interacting so immediately with the voice that then I suppose that, that does bring in options to have people from other fields who know have different areas of expertise to kind of analyze this music. Uh, I'm sure they won't, but it, there is the potential for them to do that. Um, okay, another thing that I've seen like in your book is related to I would say like maybe like lobby groups of culture whatever like like you talk about like street culture and that is like the origin of, of like this um, vocal psychedelia and then there's there would be like university culture and then I would say there's like capitalist like mainstream culture so how in your hypothesis, how do like these three things relate? Because I didn't completely catch it because I felt there's like an opposition of like street culture and university culture, but I I I, I felt I didn't see as much like the presence of the mainstream, which I for me it's like more the problem at least here because university is not you know like as powerful as in the UK or yeah, in the US. Yeah, yeah. Like, so I feel like the real struggle is between main, the mainstream and street culture. Well, so I think every, everything really, everything artistic, I'm sure it happens to music a lot, you, you're constantly trying to run away from the middle brow, from the, the boring, the kind of, the, you know, so if you're young, you want to make sure you're listening to music that your parents absolutely hate. Uh, you know, if you if you want to be all trying and cool and individual, you don't want to be listening to music that's also on adverts and stuff. And so I suppose you do have this pattern of the streets will kind of produce a music, and then that will be very interesting, very kind of uh, yeah, kind of bring out loads of great stuff for a little while, and then eventually advertisers will start getting hold of it. Maybe university students who aren't really kind of really about that, they'll get hold of it. This is a UK phenomenon, as you're saying. Uh, and so I suppose, yeah. So I think this, this drill is a good example of this. So kind of drill from maybe 2016, 2017, 2018. As I said, it really felt like you were in this secret little world. If you were a fan, you knew about something that no one else knew about, that the police were trying to shut down, 
that it, you know, it's had this whole kind of secret language no one knew about. That you, you know, the thing of, because I live sort of in the areas where drill songs, you know, they talk about. So you kind of, you're all aware of the different places they're talking about and all that. Whereas now, it's sort of on the TV, probably in adverts, you know. Uh, so it's kind of, it, it lost, it, it's lost a mystique. And I think along with that, uh, I think when the mainstream gets hold of things, it tends to become less innovative because I suppose you're just trying to sell the same thing over and over again to make money. And so, yeah, so I suppose in the UK at least, I suppose the bridge between kind of an authentic culture and then a culture that becomes very mainstream, I think that would be university students. Maybe it's different in Spain, but I think it'd be university students. Once, once university students start liking a music, in the UK, it usually means it's about to go, not so good, about to go downhill, really. It might make sense, I think. Like, there might be a power within university in the UK that I'm not certain is the I, same I, here. There must be a lot of uh, cultural cachet, I guess, you know, it's sort of someone who's in university in five years, they might be working for a marketing agency or something, and they go, oh, remember this song. So, yeah, no, I think it is. It must, it maybe it is a very particularly UK thing. I remember an um, American saying to me he had no idea what I was talking about when I was sort of <laughs> complaining about uni culture. So maybe it is a particularly weird British thing. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we are getting close to the moment where he is going to start playing some songs. So I'm going to switch to Spanish so to encourage you to maybe ask something to Kit. Así que bueno, um, nada, quedan como cinco minutos y luego va a poner canciones. Y entonces a lo mejor estaría bien si a alguien le apetece hacer un, alguna pregunta que a lo mejor a mí no se me ha ocurrido. Que quería saber si no me he leído el libro, eso que, que, que para empezar por ahí por si acaso. Eh, el futuro para ti, Kit, eh, pasa también por recuperar a lo mejor según qué sonidos, porque hemos hablado mucho de, de nuevos sonidos, de nuevas técnicas, de nuevas maneras de de investigar la voz humana y demás, pero quería saber también qué parte de, de esos sonidos que quizá estamos perdiendo, más ancestrales, incluso la propia voz de, del hombre, esos matices, si pasa por recuperar el futuro también esas pinceladas, un poco como patrimonio antropológico musical, o si, o si el futuro para él tiene que ver con algo netamente nuevo. Well, well I, I do think uh, this, the paradigm I'm using of uh, innovation, of futurism, is sort of inherently destructive. It's all about everything old, get rid of it, only do new things. Now, that, of course, is a caricature. So, you know, I love jazz, I love reggae, I love, you know, kind of rap from the 90s, I love all this stuff, you know, so it's kind of a... You know, it's a rhetorical device, and I think it's important that we do have this this kind of rhetorical device. I think it is important we venerate newness, we venerate innovation, we celebrate these things, because uh, otherwise everything would, you know, still sound like uh, Elvis Presley or something. So we don't want that. But uh, yeah, I think with everything in life, there's a thing where it's great if we can preserve traditions and that we can all hear them, and then it's also nice if we can have mad stuff that sounds like nothing we've ever heard before. I mean, just in terms of kind of ancestral music and stuff, strangely, a lot of the stuff in this book is what I call auto-tune orientalism. It's a bit of a kind of a problematic word, but th there is a lot of the music that strangely, even though it's from Jamaica, ends up sounding kind of like ancient Sri Lankan music, sort of ancient Middle Eastern music. And so you have this weird thing where you've managed to somehow via the future, via kind of innovation, go all the way back to this stuff that sounds like, you know, stuff you'd hear coming out from a mosque or something. So, uh, so I mean, well, actually, there is a very, I think the, the past and the future, they, because they're both, they're both a bit magical to us. They're both places we kind of escape to. They're both places we mythologize and kind of make up. And, uh, and so I do think you often have this, a lot, of, a lot of the time with future music, as you could call it, a lot of it actually can, can also feel incredibly ancient as well. So if anybody's familiar with kind of dub music, you know, it's very cutting edge, but then all the lyrics were kind of very biblical, and so you did have this 
interplay between the future and the ancient past. And a lot of this stuff, so a lot of the instrumentals, uh, they do a thing, I call, I call it Codeine Exotica. So the instrumentals will have kind of Indian tablas, they'll have these kind of flutes that sound like either folk music or kind of, you know, some kind of Sri Lankan music. They'll have that kind of uh, stuff that sounds a bit like Indonesian, ancient Indonesian music. So you do have this weird thing where all of a sudden this very cutting edge futuristic modern music somehow also then resembles very old stuff. So I think it's a very interesting dynamic. Yeah. Ahí hay otra pregunta, en la prima, ah, igual hay dos, pero ahí hay una, la otra no sé. So, I want to know if in your book you have taken consideration that uh, repetition, even repetition of sounds that we already know, not know the old sounds, not the sounds that we want to, to have, uh, the repetition of sounds is one of the things that has become like Bad Bunny's trend now, because uh, somehow it generates so many dopamine on our brain that people can hear the, the same song so and so and so like thousands of times. So I just was wondering if this reputation that is what uh, also in you when you are doing religious things, I'm not a religious person, but I know that happened, you become to be in trance, like you completely left out your brain and you start to be in trance. So if you have talked about that in your book, because I have not read it yet. That translation was so good, it sounded like it was in the room. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, the thing is very, yeah, very interesting, this idea of repetition, uh, and also the idea of being entranced. So I think one of the things is, with, with, with the, the techniques in the book, with some of the vocals, you get it, you get kind of addicted to it, you know, you're kind of, so the, the, the voices can be incredibly shrill, so really, really high screeching voices. Uh, and there was a while where I couldn't listen to anything else. It all sounded so flat. This stuff was so direct screeching at you that all other music sounded, it, it didn't come out the speakers. Um, another thing in the, book, in the book talk about very fragmented voices, so kind of these little snippets of voice. Uh, and there was a while where I was just totally addicted to that. Everything else sounded too kind of, wasn't grabbing my attention. So I think, uh, you know, repetition is a kind of a hugely, I mean, firstly, it's a cru crucial part of music, because if music doesn't repeat, then it's just noise. But, um, but yeah, so I think, uh, I think, yeah, you're right. That you, 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 you're people are developing techniques now, which are things that we want to repeat, repeat, and kind of become intoxicated by, become entranced by. And I suppose then there's an argument that on a kind of wider cultural level, someone who's still listening to pop from 1970, still listening to Fleetwood Mac or whatever, they're having this kind of cultural repetition that they're listening to the songs their mum listened to, and now they're listening to it, and they've heard it in films, and so sort of kind of, I think uh, artistic stuff through repetition, it picks up affect, uh, you know. So if you think of like, uh, if, if you see a skull in a film, that's going to have all the affect from Hamlet, and it's going to have the affect from when you were a kid and you saw skulls on Halloween. So I think kind of art picks up stuff through repetition. It, it picks up new emotions. And so, um, and so I suppose, yeah, you know, in, in years' time, you know, kind of 10 years' time, a lot of this stuff will have picked up all these weird things over the years. So I think, yeah, repetition is this kind of very important thing in music. Yeah. ¿Alguien más quiere preguntar algo? Bueno, pues ya está. Vamos a escuchar las canciones. <risa> 